or to this computer. Well, we are at high noon, everybody. So I appreciate you all tuning in to this uh, special uh, Lunch and Learn. Originally, this Lunch and Learn was going to be about the Mid-Atlantic Archaeology Conference, and everybody was going to give a two-minute summary yeah. of their papers, but other events transpired. And so we are want to give our uh, community, our supporters, everyone that you know has shown their love, an update on what happened on Monday and, the re and more importantly, the recovery efforts and why we even have recovery efforts. And a l for a little bit... We unmuted. I don't know how we got muted. I am so sorry, everybody. I've been on mute. So that the is the whole time. The whole time. Yeah. So, well, I'll begin again. Thanks, everybody. We, we've been under a little bit of stress here. And thank you, Elise, for letting me know as I was on mute. Yeah, like I was saying, um, uh, we are uh, we're doing a special uh, lunch and learn um, uh, this month. Um, originally, this lunch and learn was going to be a summary of the Mid-Atlantic Archaeology meeting with all the uh, staff's papers uh, being delivered. And with the events that happened on Monday, uh, we decided that we wanted to use this opportunity to let you know, give you an update on the recovery efforts. And uh, there's so many of you all, you all that have shown support and have um, expressed concern over our well-being, the the um, the uh, collections well-being. We wanted to give you an update and a chance to ask some questions. Um, so one of the things that has allowed the recovery to happen is um, you know some of the work that the uh, orange county firefighters uh, uh carried out and uh what we, we have here is uh, uh yola dance who's our ceo and president and she wants to start it with a few words so thank you yola thank you. and thank you so much matt and um thank you to each of you for taking time out of your day to join us and i am not going to belabor the process um, in sharing, I guess I am a little bit shorter than you, <laughs> um, but I, I just really wanted to thank um, the five uh, counties who responded on um, Monday, uh, April 8th. Um, it was about 5.30 p.m. and I was leaving for the day um, and a sound caught my attention, immediately dialed 911. And if you can understand, um, if you put into GPS uh, the Orange County Fire Station from Montpelier, it takes 11 minutes um, on any day um, to get there. But we were um, responded to so quickly and so expertly that this uh, fire department arrived um, within eight minutes and they were fighting a fire. Um, that is incredible. Um, and as a resource manager, um, I've, I've planned for fire suppression systems and collections um, with national parks, um, with historic sites, with communities. And you always wonder, and you're worried about this particular type of moment and what will happen to the collections. Um, and I want to say without a doubt, we have a collection to recover because of the expert care of the firemen who responded here. And so my thanks is to um, Orange County, Gordonsville, Barbersville, Lake of the Woods, and Rapidan um, for their care in fighting that fire. Um, Matt will talk about our extensive recovery efforts, um, but um, I just wanted to um, express that thanks. Many of whom I've had a chance to meet with, um, and I'm kind of on tour visiting um, the various fire stations and dropping off treats um, and a small gift um, from our team just to say thanks, um, and especially um, to our, our three firefighters who experienced injuries. I stopped by Orange on Monday, um, and I know Harrison and Corey um, uh, were there, and then also Hunter. Um, we just really appreciate you. Um, I was on site. I was able to see as they attempted to um, put out the fire uh, in the roof, um, if you can imagine, um, and a ladder fell. Um, and I mean, the care that uh, the firefighters take of one another was just a sight to see. It was very emotional um, and at the same time, very encouraging and hopeful. And so um, I thank you all. I know some have been interpreters here before, have studied history. And so we are truly a community that cares about Montpelier, cares about James Madison, cares about descendant communities. And we're in this together in preserving the legacy of liberty. And we, and we just thank you and appreciate you for that. 
I'm going to turn the floor back over to Matt and team. Um, you can imagine my, my heart goes out to each one of you. Um, I've been here for nine months. Matt, you've been here a, a lifetime, a career, um, and um, your, your work, um, you have an incredible legacy already in creating a next generation of, of stewards, um, and, and we're with you. We're, we're here. And so um, thank you, Liz. Thank you, uh, um, uh, Christopher. And um, we've got a room that's um, full of interns who support this um, work as well. And so um, my goodness, did you say 300 people registered? 300 people registered. So whether the 164 in the room or the 300 who plan to watch the recording, um, it's it, we're all in this together and we're so much stronger together. So thank you um, from the entire team at the Montpelier Foundation, the Montpelier Descendants Committee, um, and thank you and um, Matt. All right. All right. <laughs> all right, thank you so much, Yola. And um, uh, yeah, I, what I'll do is I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share screens at this point. And like Yola said, it is so nice to see so many uh, friends, former staff, expeditioners. Uh, it is, it's a, it's, this is the, um, the, the love y'all are showing is incredible. Um, and I'm going to mute the uh, hide meeting controls. All right. So um, uh, what the, 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 as Yola mentioned, the fire, occurred uh, a week ago uh, this this past Monday. So, oh, a little over uh, 10, nine days ago. It seems like it's uh, been just uh, uh, a month. And there's been so much that we've been doing to recover the artifact collection and the, uh, the field records. And uh, like Yola mentioned, um, there were uh, there were three firefighters that were hurt and have uh, talked with Wit. He'll be on the line in a second. They are recovering, um, but the efforts of the Orange County Fire Department really is what is making our work right now even a remote possibility. Uh, the like Yola mentioned, uh, the 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 uh, trucks were on the scene by um, uh, within a matter of. Um, of uh, eight to nine minutes fighting the fire. And what would have been an absolute disaster if there had been, you know, uh, if, the, if, there, if the firefighting firefighters hadn't started, started even five minutes later, this could have spread and been much worse in both the office, but especially the, uh, the lab. And what um, uh, the firefighters were able to do is, you know, get into the space, identify where the fire was uh, the most intense, uh, get things uh, set up, which is pretty complex at this remote site, even getting on the property. It's really a testimony to the knowledge that the firefighters had of the property itself and doing these practice drills with, with Bill Bichelle. And uh, as soon as the fire was extinguished, what firefighters did is they um, invited uh, me to come into the lab and the office facility after they had tested the air to make sure that you know carbon monoxide levels were, were safe. And what they offered was the opportunity to remove as many of the artifacts and the records as possible. And so what the, the firefighters did is they stayed another hour and a half after the, the scene was secured and the fire was extinguished, which was just just a absolutely, you know, going beyond what, you know, the, the, the incredible valiant and heroic efforts that they were, had already done. So they sp spent an hour and basically daisy chained all of the, uh, um, the most important records that, uh, that we had in the lab and in the office out onto the deck. And so basically um, there was about 30 of them that lined up and basically I would take a box off the, uh, off the shelf and it would disappear and it went out into on, onto the deck. And this is what allowed us to really begin our, uh, our recovery efforts. But again, just can't emphasize enough the, um, the intensity of this fire and how fast it was spreading, you know, without the, without the uh, um, really the uh, um, shrewd and shrewd investigatory and, and str uh, strategic skills of the firefighting teams, this, this would have been a disaster. And what I'm going to do right now is, uh, uh, Whit Jacobs, are you um are you on? You could go ahead and unmute. Yes, I'm on. 
All right. Yeah, wait, I'll, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing screens right now. So um, thank you. We have a, a special get, uh, guest, uh, uh, Fire Chief Whit Jacobs, and he uh, he's he agreed to say a few words about the uh, the effort. So Whit, uh, thank you, Whit, for being here. Sure. Thank you for the invitation, and and uh, thank you all for certainly attending. Um, you know, I'll just kind of briefly just speak about uh, some of the some of the work that was done uh, initially, and then and I know Matt's really highlighted uh, a lot of work that kind of went into the the salvage and, and overhaul uh, after the fire. Um, you know, initially crews were called out for a fire alarm. And there was some confusion in the dispatch, um, which which caused a slight delay in, in units getting uh, to the appropriate location. But once they once they received the uh, a much better location on the premises, they were able to get there rapidly. They were able to establish a water supply because uh, Montpelier does have its own uh, water supply capabilities, um, and then deploy hand lines, uh, hose lines into uh, the main office building to, to really knock this thing back. When they arrived, they had uh, the bulk of the fire in the main office um, with the exposure to the archaeology lab. And our main objective was kind of twofold. One, we needed to get that fire knocked down in that office space, but we also, we had to protect the 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 exposure. Um, I was not completely aware of all of the contents inside of the exposure, the 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 lab. However, later on, I quickly learned that this was this was full of uh, uh, material that I could. That no matter what we do, we cannot replace it. Um, so we knew very quickly that we were dealing with a very 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 unique situation. Um, one of the one of the problems that we really ran into in getting the the fire completely knocked down in the in the main building, the office area, was um, I had a I had the lieutenant off of the first arriving engine company come to me uh, once I got there and told me that he could not reach the ceiling. Um, it had that that office building just has extremely tall ceilings, and it had had you know. Like many old buildings that are out there, um, it had been drywalled, uh, the drywalled over um, almost like a, a tongue and groove board. So they had a lot of trouble getting into that attic space where the where the fire had advanced. So our initial effort was tr to try to get into the gable end um, and get in there and try to knock it back. That's where the accident happened. Crews got uh, used a ladder uh, to reach the porch roof cut into that gable end. Uh, they were successful in cutting into the gable end. And then when they when one of the firefighters moved to the side so that water could be um, advanced into that attic space, that's when the front porch roof collapsed. Um, and, and one of them at the foot of the ladder, one of them on the ladder, and then one of them on the porch roof, they kind of all just spiraled down. Everybody's doing fine. Uh, they were checked out on scene um, and, and evaluated, but everybody's doing fine. And I certainly appreciate uh, all of those of you that have have uh, reached out and with concerns um, about them. But they're all back to work, and and everybody's doing fine. Once we had the bulk of that fire knocked down, it just becomes kind of a long effort of of chasing hot spots, chasing fires, and so forth, as you can imagine. Um, and in, in older structures where you're dealing with potential for balloon frame or any sort of um, older material. It just really makes that 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 effort a little bit more advanced and difficult. Um, we did have a slight exposure into the archaeology lab, um, so when you walk through that breezeway uh, in the picture that you'll see, uh, there was there was some into the attic space, but crews were very quick to get in there and really knock that down um, and prevent it from further getting into the to the lab space. I know there was water uh, that did penetrate into the lab space. Um, but, you know, I think all in all, um, this was, an, this was unique, but, uh, there were some extremely aggressive efforts made to, to really try to, to do our absolute best to prevent, to prevent any more damage than what had already been done to either the structure or the contents inside. Um, but, you know, once we had it, once we had this thing under control, like Matt talked about, and, and I got my eyes inside I knew that there were materials in there that I had no clue what I was dealing with, but I knew that they were important and I knew that I needed him to be as the expert he has been for so many years to help us figure out what is the best way to 
get this material in a safe location away from any further damage and how can we help that and all those crews on scene there was there was never a hesitation of we'll stay here as long as we need to to make sure that this stuff is cared for and and um and salvaged and saved um for that matter so um I'm hopeful that there there will be a good outcome from from this uh, as far as the materials. And um, I think there's going to be a lot of learning that will come from this also. But I think all in all, this this was a team effort between not, not only all the fire departments, but more importantly, the Montpelier Foundation and all of their experts and, and expertise that they provided us to be able to to do our job in, in cooperation with them. So. I don't really have anything else to add, Matt, but I, I can't thank you all enough for for certainly being there and, and staying. Well, I, I didn't even mention this, but we we were adamant uh, with in talking with certainly with Matt. We didn't want this thing to rekindle. We we were ninety nine point nine percent sure that there was no fire left in that either building. But you can't always be 100 percent. And you just kind of have to maintain eyes on it. And they stayed all night long and checked it. I, I'd be willing to ma bet Matt probably checked it every other minute. But um, in some cases, I know that it was checked often. Um, we did not have to return. And I'm not aware of anything that, that sparked back up. But I do know that they, they stayed there just to be sure that if something did happen, that they were going to call immediately. And we were going to come right back out and mitigate that uh, to prevent to prevent any further damage. So this was a this is a, a cooperative effort between between certainly uh, all our departments, but it more importantly, it it a lot fell to Montpelier and to, to Montpelier staff and, and they they came through. And uh, I appreciate the certainly the opportunity to talk and, and the efforts that have that have happened during the fire, after the fire and, and are continuing to happen. Thank you so much, Witt. And we one of our uh, mottos that we've always had is, uh, you know, we're we are part of the orange community, and without that, we are nothing. And this 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 uh, this event really gives testimony to that. And Wit, I mean, uh, as many of you all know, Wit has a long history at Montpelier. When you were when you were in high school, when we were doing the restoration, you were part of yep. the uh, the restoration team. So you know yeah, I... what we do with the archaeology and the restoration better than anybody. I, I had the privilege to work with John Jeans during the restoration efforts for two summers, and um, there I did a lot of sweeping up dust and everything as the guests came through. But you know, seeing Matt in the in the front yard and having an opportunity to work on the front portico with Mac Ward um, and John and all of those artists, it was that that was that was a special moment and and this is this is not necessarily a good moment uh to, to be back on Montpelier property but this is still a special moment to say that we could do our part to to continue to to preserve uh the legacy of, of james madison and all those that served on that property thank you so much wit really appreciate it yes sir and uh Whit, you got you got to come out and dig with us at some point and all the firefighters do we got to do a uh, firefighters expedition that would be amazing so absolutely we'll get this going so <laughs> all right thank you Whit. appreciate you coming yes, on thank you all all right i'm going to go back to uh sharing the screen here and uh liz and chris and i have put together a presentation that really goes over the um what are efforts that we are doing now because of the orange um uh, fire department were actually able to begin recovery of uh, of, of the archaeology, uh, bo both the artifact collection and the uh, and the records. And again, without the firefighters, there, there were we, we would have no recovery. We still have a lot of work in front of us. So much of the work that we need to do is uh, like uh, Liz and Chris and myself will talk about is water remediation because we needed to get that pond water into that that lab and office to put the fire out. And uh, what we, you know, on, on Tuesday uh, morning, what we started with was an assessment of uh, where we were at. And by, by Wednesday, um, we hit the ground running. Uh, Chris is going to be talking about the uh, uh, safety equipment that we used. We needed to, we couldn't just get right in there and start work. We needed to make sure that we were all uh, safe because of the, of the, uh, the soot um, that was in that area. And also work with um, 
with uh, Mike, the uh, the fire marshal, on making sure that you know we were in the proper locations to aid his efforts to identify uh, the cause of the fire and and to make sure that we were in safe safe the safest parts of the buildings. So with the um, the initial recovery, um, what um, we uh, were involved in, and Liz is, is going to go into this in more details, is it involved getting all of the uh, the paper records, the art artifacts, and some of the equipment to a location away from the scene. And uh, one of the problems was is that we had um, uh, wet artifacts, wet records. They needed, and also they were covered in soot. So we didn't want to put any of this into any of our permanent buildings where people would not have proper safety equipment on. So we used uh, a, a secure location on the property uh, to as a staging area, and we're still working uh, through this. Um, and in the staging area, we've got two separate locations, one for um, drying things out and another one where we're, we're uh, uh, reboxing and rebagging for uh, soot control. And what I'm gonna go into, we're dividing this into, into three parts. The, we've divided the triage into three different teams. One is the uh, paper record recovery of you know the uh, of the records for the excavations that have happened over 35 years. I'm going to talk about that. Then Liz is going to talk about the um, the recovery of the artifact assemblage and and uh, the triage needed for that, uh, so it can go into um, conservation. And then finally, Chris is going to talk about um, what we did for uh, safety protocols for staff, and then also recovery of the. Um, of the of the equipment so we can get back into the field uh, once again so for the um for the paper recovery what we quickly had to assess is we basically have three different ways that we stored our uh field records um and in going from i'll just put it this way least effective to most effective um the most a lot of the modern excavation records were in three ring binders and notebooks those fared the worst. They're open storage, as you can imagine, to water and soot and smoke damage and the heat. Um, the uh, ones that were in plastic file folders um, were a little better protected, but with the heat, those plastic uh, file folders melted, exposing the, uh, the records to both moisture and to, the, to heat damage and the soot. And then finally, the rock solid areas was the um, uh, records that were in steel filing cabinets that were closed. And what is fortunate is the records that were most vulnerable uh, were the ones that we had already begun a scanning project. We began, uh, we got a, a grant from a, from a donor, Cindy Ruscha, uh, back in 2017, to begin developing a GIS system, which we paired with scanning all, start scanning all the records and integrate that into GIS. And this uh, was also known as scan, scanning Matt's brain into GIS, because I was the only one that knew all the, where all these things were. And if I was uh, hit by a meteor, I'll leave it at that. If I was hit by a meteor, all that information would be gone. So what we were able to do over the past several years is uh, scan all these objects. And when I say we scan, one person that really deserves a, a, just a, 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 a medal for all this is Ron Downs, who was last year's 2004 Volunteer of the Year. Ron has spent thousands of hours scanning records. Uh, he is a, a NASA um, a, a, a uh, physicist uh, worked on the Hubble telescope and is so he is particular as we are about the work that he does. So, and you know, archaeologist, triple recording everything. So what Ron did is he went through, and if you notice the initials right here, um, RD for Ron Downs, all the notebooks that are behind Liz and uh, Ron here, these, along with many, many others, are ones that he was involved in, in scanning. And once these were scanned, they were put into, um, into uh, uh, Google, the Google Drive, and then they were digitized. And who did this work was um, uh, our volunteer base. So many of you all that have been on expeditions have been through my uh, MAP lecture, Montpelier Archaeology Archive Project lecture, which is paired with the work that we, we uh, a grant we received from the Institute for Museum and uh, um, uh, Library um, uh, Sciences for Museum for America's grant. And what the, what the uh, volunteers do is they relabel all of the scanned records that Ron had scanned uh, in, in the, the Google Drive, name them associated with the units, and then digitize them into. And I have to keep putting in the passwords. And go to device um, settings, select the. Yeah. And uh, something is locked up here. Let's see. Um, 
Yeah, maybe I'll hit escape. And go to slideshow again. A little bug was there. All right, we're back. So what we've done is we've, um, with the digitization, all of these records are digitized into a 3D model in GIS, both a 2D and a 3D model. And in this, this uh, 3D model, what we do is all the um, all these granular records are associated with the location. And just like Whit mentioned, I decided to use this part of the uh, the model, the front yard that Whit witnessed when us doing excavations on. All of these records are tied to individual units and features. And what this allows is for the, um, the data to be uh, both have um, granularity, to have data um, uh, integration with the uh, the model, and then also to be able to integrate the data into a um, into multiple platforms. And what this really ensures is that the uh, data has um, escape again. Um, sorry about this. There, it's locking up. Um, what this allows is that when we have this data scanned in, instead of just being on a hard drive and being vulnerable to whatever could happen to it, it's on the on a cloud base, which means that we're constantly making sure that the data is protected, that the granularity of it is one that can shift between platforms, and that we've got um, a, a data uh, um, redundancy. And all this is important for you know what we preserving uh, the, the records. Another part of what we've got with the archaeological, uh, the more recent, the last 20 years of archaeology, is a whole bevy of archaeology reports that allows a lot of the paperwork that was stored in other, like the plastic folders, to also be redundant. And what this leaves us with is, you know, uh, we were, we were very, very quickly able to sort through the records that were redundant to what we've digitized and is digital and those that needed immediate attention. And one of the things that we're working on right now is for those records that have not been digitized, we're both air drying these uh, to uh, get rid of the moisture. And then for select records that are more problematic, we're working with the, the uh, Mac uh, freeze dryer uh, at their lab at the Jefferson Patterson Park. And they're going to be helping us with um, uh, some of the more critical records like the older notebooks. Now, for um, the, once they're dried out, we're going to be need to do conservation on these with de-sooting. We're going to need to be consulting with other um, uh, cultural heritage professionals on this and con conservationalists. But once these are uh, de-sooted, we're going to need to scan these and digitize them into GIS. And fortunately, you know, I don't know if you believe in Providence, but there's so many times in my life, and this is one of these I do, there are records that I could not find over the past 10 years of digitizing. And when all these records were moved out, those boxes appeared. And there are ones that are just like, the, you know, the stable quarter are gone. We found them. There are records from the um, uh, encampments that we found on the back, back drive. Those records appeared. And it was just like old friends coming back. So, you know, talk about, you know, scanning Matt's brain. This was absolutely incredible. So the records that did survive both in the plastic boxes, but especially in the, um, in the file cabinets, are ones that we're able to save. And the ones that are in the file cabinets are Lynn Lewis's legacy. And Lynn, I, I hope you're out there. I'll be contacting you about some of this. You're all putting these records so organized into metal filing cabinets is what saved your legacy. And before I retire, I wanna get all of your records scanned, digitized into, and into GIS. So we, we've got some uh, discussions and some, some drinks to have together. But um, uh, this and what's amazing about you just for archaeologists and and folks doing records out there, this drawer of this filing cabinet was closest to the most intense heat of the fire. And with all the care that the fire department took, just the tops of these files were singed and there was no moisture damage whatsoever. So just absolutely incredible. Most of the of these and the file cabinet just had a light layer of dust. One of the other areas that is just, um, for me personally, just heartbreaking is the library. Uh, this is a, a library collection of both um, my books, uh, books that Montpelier has bought and Lynn Lewis's books. There's over a thousand volumes in this, in this library. Most are reference guides for artifacts that guide staff and interns use on a daily basis in the lab. And others are references that, uh, you know, all of y'all have used for uh, for, map, for the papers at conferences. And being in a rural location, we've accumulated this over the years by buying books used on Amazon. 
so that instead of having to go to a university library, which isn't close, we've got our own library here. And I know a, a number of you have offered to um, purchase books. Uh, Hillary Hicks, who's uh, uh, right here in the audience, I'm turning my camera, Hillary's waving. Uh, she generously um, provided the, the library catalog and we're gonna be um, making a list of those books that you all could help us with. So thank you for that. Um, so uh, with that, you know, um, what I wanna do is turn it over to Liz for the, uh, for the um, curatorial or the uh, artifact recovery. So thanks Liz. And sometimes it gets funny. Okay. Uh, so I've just been using the uh, arrow. If it locks up, I'll help you out. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Liz McCaig. I'm the archaeology lab director here at Montpelier. I'm going to walk us through our triage system for the archaeological collections that were in the lab. We were so fortunate to have the support of the local fire department to help us remove most of the fragile and most at-risk artifacts in the collection the night of the fire. In the days following the fire, archival artifact boxes, while removed from the lab the night of the fire, were wet and boxes became weak and unable to be picked up from their handles, necessitating careful handling. We worked with our operations and maintenance team, including Bill, Greg, and Tomas, uh, to develop a plan for transporting the fragile boxes safely to our new temporary storage location. We also needed to carefully remove the artifacts that were located in our display cases and luckily these were well protected from the fire. In these images, you can see the removal of the carnelian ring and our tear for Poland transferware ceramic sherds from the display cases. These objects and all others have been moved to a secure location to protect them while they off gas, while we rebag artifacts into sterile bags and boxes and allow things to dry out. The objects from the, dis uh, the display cases and anything extremely fragile were transported out of the lab and the deck by our amazing team of archeologists on staff, pictured here. We set up a daisy chain to move samples as safely and quickly as possible. For our more sturdy boxes, we were able to work with Greg from o &M to carefully lift and transport pallets of boxes from the lab to our new temporary storage location on property. He also helped us relocate our industrial drawers containing our study collection, which thankfully were all protected from the fire. Without Greg's help, the process of moving the 239 boxes out of the lab would have still been ongoing. Thank you so much to Greg, Tomas, and Bill for all your hard work. As I mentioned previously, we identified a new temporary storage location where we could dry out the wet artifacts and purchase milk crates so that we could dry out bags of wet artifacts once they were out of their wet boxes. Shout out to Chris for his great idea with the milk crates because uh, it's just worked out so well so far. We are purposely taking these precautions in a temporary location so that we can manage the soot contamination before, before moving things to their more permanent locations. Once in the new location, the crew began to track every box that came into the lab, its condition, and whether it needed to be dried. Each box or sample was labeled with pink flagging tape and logged into our Airtable system, which Chris will discuss in a moment. We began to separate the boxes into wet and dry with the back room for dry boxes and the front room pictured on the left for wet boxes. The next step has been removing and discarding all wet soot covered boxes, moving low impact artifact bags into new parent bags and allowing the dehumidifiers and fans to do the hard work of drying out wet samples and artifacts. At the moment, our archaeology staff are working tirelessly to rehouse artifacts into new parent bags and boxes to prevent mold and place all artifacts into a new clean environment. We have 239 boxes of artifacts to go through and rehouse, and luckily we have been getting offers from our incredible volunteers, as well as our wonderful colleagues at Monticello, to help us with this process. Once everything has been rehoused, the artifacts will be transported to a climate-controlled storage facility on the Montpelier property for the time being. We will also be assessing the plastic melt damage pictured here um, that did unfortunately occur to some of our ceramic collections, um, but we are in collaboration with the Maryland Archaeology and Conservation Lab in Southern Maryland to assess these collections. The Mac Lab conservators will be conducting mitigation and conservation on these luckily mostly treatable artifacts. Overall, we are moving forward every day and I just wanna extend my utmost gratitude to our team, the firefighters, the National Heritage Responders, and the support of so many of our colleagues far and wide who have allowed us to move forward with so much help, love, and support. 
Now I'm going to turn it over to our field director, Chris Pash, to discuss equipment, safety, morale, and more. Thank you, Liz. Hopefully, I hopefully this is aimed right. Um, a little taller. <laughs> um, my name is Chris Pash. I'm the field director here, and as you all can probably imagine. Um, we had just begun the field season, actually, when this event happened, and obviously that is being paused so that we could focus our efforts on recovery and assessing. Thank you. All right, hopefully you can see me better. Um, let's switch pages. So the first major step in all of this recovery effort was not only researching, but consulting um, with the what was the name of the organization, the National Heritage uh, Responders. Um, you all provided us so much input and based off your experience and knowledge with similar situations, we were able to adapt safety protocols so that we could send our team in to recover um, using the best gear that we had access to. Um, we adapted um, P100 respirators, full Tyvek uh, coverage suits, nitrile disposable gloves so that we were we could dispose of those and not contaminate as we worked through rehousing and moving the collections and records, um, as well as goggles to help prevent um, anything from getting in our eyes, whether soot or other particulates or mold, If, if although we were able to get most stuff out before that began. Um, but the real, the, the reason this was so important is the fire, obviously it's gonna create a lot of heat. It created a lot of uh, soot, plastics that were um, thermally altered. There was a lot of off-gassing and aerosolized stuff in the air that we wanted to protect our team from so that there wasn't any irritants to our respiratory systems. And some of that stuff can be high risk for developing cancer and stuff like that. So safety was the pri primary thing, even though it's happening late in this uh, presentation. It is first. Um, all right. So once we were all geared up, and as Liz discussed, we recovered the artifacts and collections first, uh, we moved into recording the equipment and the impacts there. So our equipment storage room took, well, there was no burning of the equipment. The heat was intense back there, and a lot of the soot and smoke was kind of settling in that area. It got so hot that some of the boxes you can see on the left side here were actually fused shut. Um, and you can see the soot running down the wall. So we basically used our archeological techniques and photographed everything in situ um, so that we could create a robust inventory of everything um, and be able to record its damages and uh, kind of work towards replacement and getting back up on our feet for both the lab and field processes. All right, next. Um, so as both Matt and Liz alluded to, both the recording of the documentation of 40 years of archeological work, um, as well as the collections that was in the process of whether it was through analysis, vesselization, um, or from recent projects being cataloged, we adapted systems that our whole team was already used to using. Um, as archeologists, like Matt said, we record things a million different times in multiple places, both in cloud and on paper. And so we used Airtable, which we already utilized for collecting samples in the field for tracking the process as they get brought to the lab, washed and all of that. So we use this for basically adapted, adapted these systems to track the damage, take photos of every single box and the impact of the event on that, as well as its status in um, housing and rehousing. We did the same exact thing for the records um, using very similar systems to track that here. And so big shout out to the whole archaeology team. Um, you all were able to quickly pick up instantaneously. We had our first meeting and you all just could use the system instantly and were thorough. You took all that training from the last year and just applied it to uh, hopefully never or once in a lifetime experience, but should never be. Um, so thank you. So through all of this, from the beginning on day one, Yola, you opened up your uh, residence here, Bassett House, for to make space for us to kind of recoup, provided mental support, um, snacks, things to refuel archaeologists um, as we 
prepared and planned for this massive recovery effort um, that's still ongoing. And that that one day really allowed us to strategize and come at it after the on the second day with full full energy. And on after that first meeting, which you can see in the top right corner, we we dubbed ourselves the Soot Sprites. <laughs> um, if anyone's a fan of Studio Ghibli, they'll get that reference. Um, but I like this this picture of like us carrying out the artifacts. Um, but through it all, the team found ways of finding fun and joy where we could throughout the process um, and just keep up morale because it is it is impacted impactful on all of us I mean 40 years of hard work and you know anything we could do and other departments chipped in whether it was buying us lunch snacks we are, our hearts go out to you all so thank you um, all right I'm going to hand it back to Matt uh, to finish up thank you Chris yeah, in in that uh, along that same line, um, the the community, you know, we the the for everyone that's come on an expedition has has worked here as part of the Montpelier team. We always talk about community, and community is what like showed up after this event. I mean, what would have been an event that we you would think would absolutely cripple us has actually renewed us. And, you know, it's a testimony to everyone, everybody, like in the audience here, we have the pony, what we're called the Pony Barn Pals who have uh, brought us lunch. We have the archeology span team that's here, uh, like uh, Chris and Liz mentioned, Yola who uh, provided to her home. And then, oh my goodness, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the maintenance uh, team here, buildings and grounds team helped out with, uh, with their equipment, just jumped in. And then also, our uh, local uh, uh, archaeological co archaeological colleagues from Monticello and CW have literally, you know, they, they've gotten gotten us the boxes and bags that we absolutely need because a lot of what we need with this is speed in terms of being able to have the supplies to do the work. And because of the damage that happened to a lot of this that was in the lab, we just can't go and use those supplies. So we're constantly going like, oh, well, we have plenty of pencils. No, we have no pencils. And, you know, I'm not sure when or if we're ever able to access those materials. Uh, this is something insurance adjuster is looking at. But one of the um, the things that has really been helpful is um, one of the one of the uh, what things we're really down on is uh, computers. And uh, Dennis David, a number of you all know Dennis. He's a metal detectorist. He has an IT company. He brought in uh, three uh, uh, computer, th three desktops with these incredible uh, three screen arrays that we have never had. So we, we've actually increased our computing capacity. And then the, the extremely, extremely generous gift that, that uh, Dennis gave us is getting us on our feet. And not, it's not just Dennis, we, the, the, the whole community has shown up. And what's really important about the, um, the gift that, that, that we're, and why we're asking for assistance with this is we need the, the resources right now to be able to get back on our feet. And um, what we uh, need to do is be able to get the equipment so that we can be back out in the field. Uh, we, we For the field program this year, we still are um, doing the 2024 archeology span memorialization. Uh, the, we're working very closely with Yola and the MDC on this entire process to make sure it's successful. And we put so much effort into, and all of you all have the, the expedition community in making this happen. And so, our plans are that for the next month, we're in recovery mode. We're going to, we need to get the collection safe. We need to make sure that we're, the staff is safe in, in the process of doing this, but we need to rebuild all of our tool collection. We can't go out in the field without iPads. We can't go out in the field without tools. And so this is where, you know, your ability to help us out on this uh, is just, is, is just a huge uh, uh, boon to what we're trying to do. Now, how this impacts the programs is, our goal, and I, I think it's very possible, we've been, all the archaeology staff have been looking at this and the field crew have been in the field putting back together the tents, lab crew is is doing the triage right now, is we are looking to be, to do our uh, annual archaeological field school beginning at the very end of May. And um, uh, as part of that, that's where we get our, our next group of, of interns that work with us throughout the whole year, which is so critical to everything that we do. And, and this year, you know, both the staff, the archaeological technicians and the interns, you all have just been a lifesaver on this. I would, wouldn't, wouldn't want to do this 
you would never want to have this happen, but the 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 energy and the um and the just the uh, tenacity that we've shared together this is a lifetime moment and we are always going to be bonded with this you all and for everybody that this this is a team so one thing that um uh, so many folks that were on the may program that we had to cancel they've moved their uh their um their slots into uh, uh, September, August, September, and October. There are still slots in the program this year if y'all are interested in coming on a dig. If you're interested in that, uh, drop us, uh, Stephen Billy, or the Montpelier archaeologist, public archaeologist, an email at dig at montpelier.org. He's in the uh, the back room there. Stand up, uh, Stephen, and wave. So I don't know if you can see him through the window. So there's Stephen. Um, but um, we we want to have this make, I, I see this is only making our community stronger and the kind of archaeology that we can do even better. And this really doubles down. I know a lot of you all have heard us talk about this in the, in the Lunch and Learns and when you're here on programs, is that our goal moving forward is not being a research uh, uh, archaeological organization, not, a, not necessarily just a public archaeology organization. We're going to be all that, but a community-based archaeological department because community is where it's at. It's what keeps us inspired. And this is you know inspired by the work we've done with the MDC. And so... We're gonna we're gonna move forward and be stronger with all this. And um, what I'd love to do now is um, open the floor for questions or any additional items. Yola, would you want to end us with anything? Do you, would you want to add anything else? I know I'm calling you on the spot here, so. But um, you're good. Yeah, that's that sounds question. beautiful. Thank you, Yola. Let's get rid of the um, the stop screen share here. And yeah, we can open up the floor. I'm going to look at the chat to see um, what questions there are here. Um, oh, Elizabeth, thank you. Textbook recovery. Um, uh, yeah, David asked, can I ask what caused the fire? Um, we are uh, just get we the um, the uh, the fire marshal Mike uh, um, uh, Thorne. My, his name, Mike, your name just jumped out of my head. Mike Thorne. My, Thorn, goodness, Mike, you know who you are. You're, I think you're out there in the audience. What's that, Elise? All right. Well, Mike is turned in his report yesterday. And um, Yola, would you want to say anything about that? Okay, that'd be great. Mike Throckmorton. Mike Throckmorton. I yes. love your last name, Mike. It's beautiful. All right. So um, Mike Throckmorton uh, was on site immediately um, and began his investigation. Um, yesterday, we received the final report, um, and we understand it was electrical malfunction, um, no cause. So there wasn't human error involved um, in the fire um, based on their final report. Um, one of the challenges that um, all historic sites and you know organizations and programs um, face when we have um, different types of materials in a particular place is whether those materials are flammable or um, can ignite. And so uh, when you have a robust program like this, um, part of what we have to think in terms of is how do we um, prevent um, situations like this in the future? So um, I'm right there with you all. There's so many lessons learned. And so one of the steps we took um, immediately following um, uh, these events was to do a walkthrough of several buildings on site. Um, and so we have actually a security task force um, and uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Hillary Hicks leads that um, effort. Um, and um, we're bringing together that team um, to assess really over 120 buildings. Um, so it's incredible when you think about 2,600 acres, 120 structures, the historic mansion, um, the future memorial, um, and all that goes into keeping um, all of these resources safe um, and protected. And so um, we really appreciate, again, um, the fire department and um, their effort uh, in helping us. And so there's an incredible community of um, vendors and consultants who uh, support us um, beyond that um, in prevention. So a big part of my work um, in supporting our entire team um, is in thinking about prevention. Um, so thank you for that question. Thank you, Yolda. Okay. Um, let's see. What other? And if anyone um, 
wants to unmute and have any questions uh, that they would like to uh, to make, um, uh, welcome that. I'm looking through this. Yeah, we will share the book list. Uh, that's something a, a number of folks have uh, asked about. Um, uh, let's see. Thank you for teamwork. Yeah, that that's this is one thing that this um, event has made us really look seriously at is. You know, one is our, uh, our digital uh, curation. I think that that has been a real, uh, could have made this into an absolute disaster because there are records that were destroyed in the archaeology office, but, you know, somehow those were those were already digitized and we, we have very little losses in that area, but we've got a lot of restoration work that we need to do to the records and to the, uh, to the artifacts. Um, uh, I think that you know one thing that many of y'all have heard about you know through the years is that the, the um, office building is a, a building that's over a hundred years old. It's been readapted from being a building that was used to store and dry fruits and nuts, um, and then turned into a residence by 1910. So um, and then also the lab is a lab that was donated by uh, James Madison University. There are some older classrooms uh, that uh, the lab lab uh, manager then, uh, uh, Kim Trickett, when she saw it coming over, she was like, that's the building I, I was worked in at JMU. It's coming back to haunt me. And we built it into a beautiful structure, which we loved. I mean, I, I personally and the crew personally worked on this in 2008, but the, the, life, um, the life expectancy of that building we were putting at about 10 years back in 2008. And so it, it's gone beyond that. And uh, it's, um, you know, uh, it's something that we, we do need. A, we're, we're looking at, you know, the near term uh, um, relocation for archaeology, but then also looking at long term as well. And this is something I'm looking at my uh, 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 Pony Barn friends is something that we've talked about for years is combining uh, facilities both for visitation, for curatorial, a whole research for a whole wide range of uh, activities that can be grouped together and be more efficient. So sometimes these things, you know, uh, like mentioned, no one, no, no one was uh, hurt critically and those firefighters that were hurt uh, are, are recovering and we're, our thoughts and prayers are gonna continue with them. Um, uh, someone asked the, um, is the MDC April 27th program still going to occur? Yes, it is. We are, uh, we are still doing, Jerome Bias, I've been on the phone with him, uh, constantly over the past week. We are looking to have the cooking program be a, a program that is, uh, basically a healing, uh, program for the crew and for, uh, for all of us. And then on the 27th, we are going to have the community day, that, um, uh, and th that's one that is, is a um a, a, a private um event but we're going to be extending the work from that into our programming for the rest of the year and also looking to do another similar program to that sometime in october but too early right now to determine that but as we always do with expeditions we're we're taking the lead from you all our community members and so these i know there's a lot of things a lot, a lot of these programs that um, there, there are some programs that we have uh, eight people and we could have 16. This cooking program is one that we're going to want to do again because we're oversubscribed. And Jerome said, Matt, we can't have any more people in the cooking program because there'll be people, people standing around for a week not having anything to do. And then, no, Matt, I cannot feed more than 100 people. So, in fact, I don't know how we're going to feed 100 people, but, you know, it's Montpelier. We're going to do it. But, you know, what it means is we're going to do this again. So everyone who is has asked about this, you know, uh, keep your uh, your your uh, ear out. We're gonna we're gonna be working on this. Um, Matt. Yes. If I get Gail. a quick question on an expedition, uh, the week long expedition, first of September, looks like in what you sent out, it had been cut back to just a weekend. Yes. Is is that correct? Yeah, we're we're doing. Thank you, Gail. The um. That that uh, we can the week long program that we had at the very beginning of September we had uh, no one had signed up for and so what we wanted to do was an, use that as an experiment actually um, uh, Stephen came up with this idea and Chris I and mean, everyone did it was something we've been thinking about for years we want to run that as a week long program and um, 
I'll talk to you separately about that, Gail, because I know where you're heading with this. But um, there, there is some uh, um, possibilities of extending it for individuals, but we need to look at where we're at. But what we'd like to do is run it Friday. It's uh, Thursday through Sunday night and try to make it into like an experiment on how to do a, a weekend program. This is something we were doing pre-COVID, but then when with COVID, uh, we, were, we had to uh, shift uh, uh, forces on that. So thank um, you yeah um yeah if anyone has um equipment they're interested in donating please contact you know chris liz or i you know you know the person person to, to contact for that um uh for the the lab and the offices we are waiting for those to be assessed you know uh um see uh mike you asked about this and mike was a long time volunteer in the archaeology lab and built many of the cabinets that are in there. Uh, Mike, I, I, we don't know what we're going to be, where we're going to be relocated um, in the near term. Um, that's something we're assessing right now with Yola and, and the team. Um, I, I don't um, foresee us going back into the, the existing archaeology lab or office without extensive renovations or just complete rebuilding. And so what this avails us of is an opportunity to assess, you know, where we should be in the short term and what the pros and cons are. How, you know, do we readapt um, a, a building or build a new building that could be used for short term if we, we do plan to build a larger facility that's combined with other aspects of Montpelier and then reuse that building that we'd use in the short term for the long term. So there's just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get way ahead of my, um, my, uh, my role here and I'm going to stop. So uh, there's a lot of team that we need to talk about. Um, let's see. Um, yeah. And again, for those of you all that might have had to cut out early, we're going to be, um, uh, uh, rec we've recorded this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Carolyn. Hey, Carolyn. And Carolyn, Go ahead. You can unmute yourself there. Carolyn was just was on the program that literally we had last week. The ex, we had a, a, a full expedition that arrived on Sunday night. Uh, Monday, we were in the field starting the excavations at the burial ground. Carol was part of that. And Carol, uh, how are you doing? I'm OK. I was terribly disappointed and also really upset with the with the fire. And, and I realized that it, the program that we were um, expecting to be able to to measure the trees and and survey the enslaved burial ground that I was so looking forward to doing had to be stopped, and I really looked forward to returning to continue that work. Um, Patricia and I uh, stayed around for a few days because it was her first time there. And I was able to take her through the old growth forest where I measured a, a tree with my arms. It was probably 40 inches on mm. diameter. And we spent two and a half hours in the, the basement of the mansion, um, going through all of the stories, all of the readings, um, and a, a mere distinction of color, um, which was a really emotional experience for both of us. I had never spent that long mm. there, but it was really good to do, and the restored cabins outside in the south yard so i was able to to provide her with a good flavor of this of the place um, well, carolyn there is no one that could you know give testimony especially uh to patricia of you know what we've done at montpelier than you 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 the first program you came on was in uh 2007 and when that program was happening in the fall of 2007, we were, we had moved the trailers from JMU over to the current location. Then that January of 2008, 
um, that we held our first uh, uh, ceramics workshop, later became the lab program, and we held it in the old lab that's just, just down the hill. And so you remember those tiny rooms that we were in. And then that next season in 2008 is when we opened up the uh, the new lab. And that was a, a dream come true for all of us to have a, a facility where you know we could have 16 people in a room that was wide open. And so um, this is what we're, you know, aiming to, 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 to rebuild with. And so, yeah, it was, it was uh, absolutely, uh, I don't know if prophetic is the right word, but it was absolutely beautiful to have you on this. Uh, it, I'm at a loss for words, but it was wonderful to have you uh, last week here and just sorry that things happened the way they happened. But um, I hope we're, to come uh, back in the fall. In the fall, you're going to continue that that program September. Yeah, we are. Or we're going to look to reschedule that, and uh, we'll get back to you. But um, but we're at one o'clock, and one tr thing we always want to do with these expedition or the um, lunch and learns is respect everybody's time, and please keep the um, the emails uh, the um, the uh, calls coming. Um, if you want to know how to help, reach out and. Uh, We'll be in touch very soon. But um, thank you all so much for attending today. Your all's support and love just it's it means the world to us. And it's it's getting us through what otherwise would have been an absolute tragedy. So thank you all so much. And good to see so many of you all here. I see so many so, so many friends here. So all right. Take care, everybody. Bye bye.